Hello and welcome back to another year of Talking Tents, a RaceBot TV podcast. After taking a couple of months off to recharge and focus on kicking 2020 up one off with a bang on RaceBot TV, we return refreshed and raring to go. Thank you for joining us either live across RaceBot social media channels or through the audio version released on a podcast app of your preference the very same day. As always, my name is Arjuna Kankipati, and I'm joined by veteran esports commentator Connery Maddock with Hugo Luis down in the production booth, kicking off all the action. And Connery, we've taken a couple of months off. There's lots of new stuff that we've been showing off on RaceBot TV. And surprisingly, two months into a new year, we're halfway through our Porsche Tagore Esports Super Cup. Yeah, time flies when you're having fun, doesn't it? But of course, the past season started a little bit earlier this time around than it usually does to give a little bit of space towards the end of 2021 for maybe or maybe not something special, I don't know. But uh, um, given that situation, you know, we, we got most of the races under our belt now. We're well into the second half of the season now, and it does seem like the, uh, the lay of the land has been set somewhat. And it's very interesting that Car got an update in the build-up to this season, and it's produced some really crazy racing, lots of pack racing, if you ask me. And the championship picture, very interesting. Let's jump into it straight off the bat, Connie, because Sebastian Joe versus Joshua Rogers, this is the battle we were expecting to play out on track. However, it's not really gone that way. And I think it's fair to say, Josh Rogers returns with a vengeance. He's only finished lower than second once this season. Yeah, absolutely. That was basically the main problem was the consistency throughout the 2020 season wasn't it and that's basically where Sebastian Job was able to best Josh on on a lot of occasions he's just been keeping himself out of trouble and with a, when Joshua Rogers is out of trouble he's you know the best guy out there uh, by sometimes by a country mile so um, it's great to see him back on his feet and uh, you know doing what he does at the very front of course helped in no small part by the amount of friends he has at the front but I think people know my know my stance on that all too well so I probably um, probably won't tell too much uh, too much into what I feel about that but um, but yeah, you know, you can't fault him. Uh, the, the, the way he carries himself individually uh, out there on track, you know, is uh, is second to none this season, uh, at least. And um, looking likely, I would say, to become your first repeat champion in the Porsche Tagore Esports Super Cup. But, you know, one bad round, one, one situation where he does poorly in a sprint in the main race, then really back to square one. And maybe some of his other teammates can maybe challenge him for the championship lead or even Seb can come back from you know, what is quite a margin back at this point. Uh, still a lot of things to look forward to uh, perhaps, but as long as Josh keeps it on the grace for, for the rest of the season, he's probably got one foot on that top, top step already, but I know some people don't really like me saying that too early. <laughs> well, you don't want to put the uh, commentator's curse on it. I literally put the curse on a race yesterday where, as I was saying, they hadn't had a caution yet, the caution flag flew. Let's talk a little bit about some of the other Coanda drivers, though, before we jump into some of those other camp championship contenders that we might have been expecting to be closer to the front because it's a Coanda 1-2-3. You mentioned the friends out there. We won't get into uh, some of the controversy that arose from the <laughs> first two races. That's been covered already I plenty I of times. We, I think we covered that when it happens, so it's, uh, there's no need to do it again. <laughs> there's no need to do it again, but Coanda 1-2-3, <laughs> Mitchell De Jong, Charlie Collins, second and third. I'm very impressed by Mitchell De Jong, who's of course now Connery, really getting into the swing of things. He's moved into the Coanda house, also competing in the eNASCAR Coca-Cola series. He must have a very busy set schedule of competition now. Yeah, that's the main thing for him coming into the second half of the season now. Um, so many things going on. I gotta say, you know, of course, um, I've even heard it from people around him saying that obviously it didn't really prepare that much for Daytona because it's Daytona in the NASCAR Coke series. You know, you don't really need a lot of practice around Daytona. It's all about mainly just getting the setup right and getting the qualifying down. Um, and that's, you know, the setup at least is other people's responsibility for the most part. So uh, you can understand that. But once we get to, you know, some of the more cookie cutter tracks uh, in the NASCAR series and, you know, a lot more driver skill dependent circuits then 
that's when Mitchell's attention is going to be potentially divided and perhaps not able to focus as much on Pesk, or if he's wanting to focus on Pesk, he won't be able to focus as much on Coke. So it's kind of a weird situation with having both of these series going on at, at the same time. I mean, it's a massive effort, and my word, like, I'd be happy just to even get close to qualifying for one series, let alone be part of two World Championships. So, um, so yeah, uh, great stuff for MB. He does have to be careful, otherwise uh, the sort of split attention is going to really put a damper on his results, and he might not be able to excel in one area uh, because he's having to do so much. So that's Koanda, the purple and orange. Always good to see them. Obviously, over a quarter of the grid uh, representing the purple and orange. Let's talk about some of the other teams then. Sebastian Joe, Maximilian Beneke. We saw them in the front of the field last season. However, one of the big names that we have been focusing our attention over the last winter season is Kevin Ellis Jr., who's now signed up with Team RLL, Apex Racing Team, partnering with Ray Hall Led uh Rahal Lederman Lanigan. I always get that one wrong, so I made sure I get it right. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> yeah, it's much easier to do that. But uh, it's great to have these real world teams coming in. And for Kevin, he's fourth place in this championship. Amazing victory in the first race weekend of the Porsche Tagore Esports Super Cup. He's also leading the Porsche Esports Carrera Cup Great Britain. So despite the fact that, you know, Joshua Rogers is running away at the front of the championship, there is still some very interesting fight between some very strong drivers further back in this championship. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, you could bring up the brilliant point with, with Kevin. He's been having a standout performance so far in 2021. You know, we saw bits of that in 2020 with some, a couple of good results, but he, he's been consistent, consistently up there, um, well inside the top 10, sometimes getting a couple of top fives. And, uh, you know, it's, it's brilliant to see because, you know, the more diversity that we get at the top of the championship with different names, the better, uh, at least as far as I'm concerned. Um, you can even say the same for someone like Dane, Ro Dane Warren, who's you know been doing particularly good recently as well. I, I mean, Sebastian Job, it's been a weird season for him so far. Um, he, he's gotten caught up in a few instances, has he? Hasn't he? And um, it's some are his own doing, some are not his own doing. That's just the, 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 the <laughs> That's just the nature of racing sometimes, but he usually comes in main races as well, which certainly doesn't help the, the point situation for him, uh, getting those bad results at the, the most important races. A um, couple of other names, uh, I mean, uh, we had at least a run of top fives, or at least close to top fives for Maximilian Bernicke, which is, you know, good to see. I want to see Max back at the front. I think, you know, like I said, just having you know, different names at the very front of the field is uh, is ultimately beneficial. Um, I gotta say though, because uh, we, we made this a topic during the previous PES broadcast actually with rookies that had done particularly well and obviously look no further than Charlie Collins. Um, brilliant driver. I mean, he, he, he does seem to not want to rock the boat too much, at <laughs> least with his teammates, because I mean, you know, why not? Because you're new in the team, you don't want to upset anyone. Um, of course, yes. I would have loved. I would have loved in that previous round to see a battle between him and Josh as like you know the slightly more established team member versus the the new new young gun that wants to you know uh, that wants to go and get everything. But I don't think we'll get that unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, Charlie's really impressed me uh, so far, and it, his his future is looking bright. So um, anything, everything's looking beneficial for Coander in particular at the moment. Uh, yeah, they're doing particularly well. Yeah, you look at the top 20 in this championship, where, of course, those drivers will stay locked in for next year's Super Cup as well. You do find a lot of those Coanda Sim Sport drivers. Let's focus in on that battle for relegation very quickly here, because it's very close. But I'm looking down the, the standings here, Connery. There are some drivers starting to be cut off here from that battle for relegation. In 20th place, it's Diogo C. Pinto on the bubble. Right behind him, the iRacing Rallycross World Champion, Johan Harth. David Williams, Moreno Sirica. You've got the likes of Salva Talens, Mikel Gard, Daniel Lafawente, uh, Maxim Reimstein, Ian Chan Guven, Joss Thompson, Brian Lockwood. There are some really big names that are heading into the second half of the season with what must be a do or die attitude. Yeah, I mean, a couple of those names surprised me. I mean, I think Johan Hart was 
also in this situation last season. I'm just going to have to go back and check, but um, which is unfortunate because Johan, always in my mind, is a driver capable of getting regularly into the top 10. And he's just had rotten luck again, I think, this season uh, with, with incidents that put him all the way to the back of the field, late 30 places and things like that. So, yeah, unfortunate for Johan. Has a lot of talent, but seemingly... Um, can't get to the checkered flag in one piece. Uh, <laughs> not saying that's his fault, but um, <laughs> at least that's the trends that uh, we've been seeing uh, so far. And a couple of the rookies as well, Mikael Guards, you know, a, a decent result in the main race of the first round of the season at Interlagos, but apart from that, that's been uh, really nowhere, um, unfortunately. Uh, there's also Josh Thompson, uh, which is going to be probably a topic <laughs> at some point, <laughs> considering his uh, uh, move of team uh, recently, shall we say, departing from Williams Esports and uh, and going to Pure Sims, I believe it is. Um, but um, yeah, it's uh, for him. I mean, we hear it all on the broadcast. You know, we got some good audio clips from him and his <laughs> team boss just trying to, you know, get his head back in the game because you know, I think Josh is one of those people that just sort of gets caught in a downward spiral. Um, and also trying to overcompensate for being in that downward spiral, and it just keeps him going downwards and downwards. And you know, it's reflected in his results so far. So, I mean, hopefully things start to change for him coming into the back end of the season. Maybe a team change is what he needs uh, to get his head back in the right space. But uh, right now, it doesn't look good. And you know, same for Brian Lockwood, who is um, on the on the bubble for the back end of 2020. He had to re-qualify. Uh, into this season and uh, again doesn't look like he's anywhere near a qualifying spot right now so yeah a couple of names further down the order that really i didn't expect to be yeah you also have the two r8g esports cars out of the uh, running right now so roman grosjean will be hoping his drivers will uh, have a bit of an uptick in performance speaking of roman grosjean though good segue to now transition into our guest day uh, guest for today grosjean of course is testing uh, an indy car at the barber motorsports park and today's guest has a lot of experience in the real life indy car as well sage Karam, driver for dryer and rainbow uh, racing as well as coanda simsport joins us now to talk all things sim racing and real racing sage delight that you're joining us here today and i'm really excited because you're one driver who started off with a lot of attention in the real world and has now kind of transitioned into doing more of the sim stuff yeah guys thank you for having me um you know it's uh been quite a journey you know with real racing and and then sim racing you know sim racing for me started out in 2007 i was a uh, beta tester for uh, for i racing i was coming from go-karts trying to get into skip barber and uh you know, they gave me my first kind of look at a Skip Barber car and were kind enough to let me get on the server and advance and, and practice for Sebring. Um, that was going to be the first track I had an event at. So I got a lot of laps there. I would go up onto my, my sim that looks nothing like my sim nowadays, but, um, you know, it got the job done and I do 100 laps a night, basically. That was my assignment. That was my that was my uh, homework, basically. <laughs> and uh, that's what I would do. And, and I went on to win the uh, karting shootout. Um, for the Skip Barber and then that's kind of how I got my career going and I've just kind of stuck with sim racing um, It's been one of those things where I've used it to learn new cars new tracks um, And then the last few years, you know I just wanted to you know take a step up in sim racing and see you know what I could do in it and uh, You know, that's when I, I got hooked up with Kawanda um, you know, I was able to qualify for the um, Porsche Sim, uh, Sim Summit in, uh, in Leipzig, uh, you know, and that was a huge experience for me, and it was, it was a lot of fun, and that's where, where I met all these guys, and, and then from there, you know, I started hanging out in their Discord and, uh, you know, got the opportunity to run with them at Daytona, and we won that, you know, thankfully I had uh, pretty insane teammates like Josh and, and Mitchell, and, uh, you know, they carried me in that, but it was a lot of fun, and I learned a lot. Well, I don't necessarily think carrying is fair. You have experience at the real Daytona 24 as well with Chip Ganassi Racing, but let's jump before even you started at sim racing because you have one of the most interesting backstories, I think, for racing that you can have. Your father was Michael Andretti's personal trainer, and so you kind of grew up in the Andretti household alongside uh, Marco, becoming very good friends with him, and really became a fan of racing because of the Andretti. So... Can you kind of explain what that was like for you? Because unlike a lot of other people where, you know, they're just watching on on TV, you got the behind the scenes look. You got to see what an IndyCar driver really looks like in their personal life. 
Yeah, I mean, it was definitely a different experience growing up. Um, you know, my my family wasn't didn't come from money. You know, my dad was a school teacher, my mom was a nurse, and uh, you know, we were fortunate enough to uh, you know become friends with the Andrettis. And and you know, basically my whole childhood, it was nearly every night I would go up there and we'd have dinner with them and and just hang out. And and Dad and Michael became best friends, and you know, they were training together and and just hanging out. So um, you know, I got to go to a lot of these races with them and, and you know be involved in, in around the hospitalities and pit lane garage access and I got to meet a lot of the drivers um, so it was cool you know it, it was definitely something that you wouldn't normally get to do so I was very blessed to have that opportunity um, and you know then I became really good friends with Marco and, and you know we grew our relationship as friends over the years and I'd say over the last like three or four years um, we became really close and you know now he's my my best man and my wedding coming up in July so um, yeah we're, we're quite close and, and you know I now now Marco actually owns the house Michael lived in so I still <laughs> go up there all the time and, and hang out um, but yeah that was a big part of how I got involved in racing it was um, you know some help from Michael and, and just kind of being around it you know I, when I'd go up there every day um, as a young kid you know I was probably eight years old I'd look around and see the big house and and uh, you know the really cool cars and the amazing trophy collection um, you know and I'd say to myself wow this is this whole race car driver thing looks pretty cool so <laughs> maybe I should pursue this and you know that's what we did and and uh, you know had a great career and a great you know great run getting the cars and and that's kind of how it all got going and well I think it was pretty cool then as well you grew up in this household you uh, grew up alongside Marco and then as you're coming up the racing ladder as well uh, USF 2000 champion Indy Lights uh, champion as well I believe with Andretti Autosport what was that experience like for you because now you're molding your own future in, in racing right you're not working in the, just as you know part of the Andretti you're now the driver representing them what was that like for you it must have been pretty surreal yeah it was you know I am like I said, you know, we, we'd go up go-karting every weekend with Marco and it was more or less just um, hanging out and, and go-karting together, but it was it was no, nothing ever really more than that. And then when I was in cars and Skip Barber and graduated from there, I went on to USF 2000 and that's when Michael made a USF 2000 team for me. So, um, you know, that was a that was a big step and, and it kind of showed that, hey, like, you know, we want to groom this kid and bring him along and maybe get him into an Indy car one day. Um, so it was one of those moments where it really looked like the dream was starting to become a reality. Um, and you know, I went on to win the uh, USF 2000 championship for Michael and uh, we went to go race Star Mazda then um, with him for two seasons and I think my best finish in that was third in the championship. I didn't really click well with that car and I wish I could go back knowing what I know now with racing and, and get another shot at it. But, um, you know, I was fortunate enough to have some backing and, and go race um, Indy Lights. And that's actually when I, I switched from Andretti Autosport and I went to uh, Schmidt Peterson Motorsports. Um, you know, Michael had two cars in Indy Lights and, and, you know, they were already occupied. So I had to go look elsewhere. And uh, I went on to go race for Schmidt. And, um, you know, I don't think I was the favorite to win the championship. Um, my two teammates were uh, two guys that beat me in Star Mazda the year before. We were all on different teams, and we kind of came together to try and make like a super team. And um, you know, I, I was able to have some luck and, and some some good races. You know, I had some bad races too, but we were able to bounce back and find ourselves going for a championship fight um, at the last race in Fontana. And I was able to come out on top and win that championship. And that's kind of what springboarded my career to get me going um, in professional stuff. And I got picked up by Chip Ganassi shortly after that as a driver developmental deal. Um, did some sports car races, the uh, Daytona 24, Sebring 12 hour. And then I got my first IndyCar start at the Indianapolis 500 in 2014. Speaking of 2014, that was a particularly big year for you, I feel, because that was your first appearance uh, in the Indianapolis 500. And for many racing drivers, uh, that is a dream come true. For regular people, it seems out of reach. Uh, for, for a lot of us, you know, how was that? You know, feeling that you're going to be taking part in 
basically the most famous oval race in the world and you know there's a chance at the end you might be uh, you drinking the milk um how was that feeling for you you know was there an incredible amount of anxiety coming into the race and coming through qualifying and, and things like that or were you actually pretty calm uh it was definitely a surreal moment um you know i have a lot of stories from me racing in in the indy 500 and and just what i've learned every year i go back um you know that one in particular i was so young i was a high school senior um you know i missed my prom to to qualify for the indy 500 which i was totally fine with <laughs> but um <laughs> you know so it, it was definitely really cool um and actually you know i think that was the least nervous i was for an indy 500 um every year i go back i feel i get more and more nervous just because i know the magnitude of the event more and more every time i go and and what it can do to to your your life and career if you win it and how hard it is to win so i get more nervous actually every time i go back <laughs> and um you know everyone thinks it would be the opposite but it, it's it's not and you know that first time i didn't really know anything you know it was my first indycar race and it was the biggest race in the world so um I just went out and drove, and I drove it like it was, you know, an Indy Light sprint race basically for 500 miles, and, you know, somehow it worked out. I, I don't know how I finished that race where I did, looking back at it, not knowing what I know now about the race, I did it completely the wrong way of what you're supposed to. So, um, yeah, it was definitely a cool experience. I finished ninth, started 31st, um, learned a lot, passed a lot of cars, and, and had a lot of fun. Um, but I think like the coolest story I have from my first my first um, experience at Indy was um, I just got done doing rookie orientation and then they opened up the track for all the drivers and I was uh, out there practicing just driving around and I saw this like little yellow dot in my mirror pretty far away um, when I was going into one and they were coming out of three and I was like I wonder who that is um, and sure enough like over the next few laps the dot became a lot bigger and I was able to make it out of who it was so I came out of four and I just kind of pulled to the inside and, and lifted and uh, didn't want to screw him up and next thing you know Elio Castro Neves is side by side with me passing the bricks with me and it just kind of like went in slow motion from there and um, I just like took a moment just to look over at him and, and just I don't know take it in and just say like, you know this is somebody I I I looked up to and watched, you know, drive this race as a young kid. And here I am, like, crossing the bricks with a three-time Indy 500 champion. It's pretty cool. Um, and, and then later that session, I went on to pass uh, Villeneuve, who was the 1995 Indy 500 champ the year I was born. And that was the first car I passed in an Indy car. <laughs> <laughs> That, that is pretty cool. But kind of going off of that stage, I want to ask you now about the next year, which of course you competed almost full time for Chip Ganassi Racing. And there was one notable moment, of course, your podium position in Iowa. But there was a bit of controversy around that with uh, Ed Carpenter maybe not becoming your greatest friend. What was that like for you? Because you talk about this experience of, you know, looking over, seeing Castro Nevers, you know, going past and what must have been just a blink of an eye, but then this very different type of an experience where now you have an experienced veteran of the series, you know, almost saying that you need to learn a little bit and respect him. What did you think about that? And how did that really change your approach for the remainder of that season? Yeah, I mean, definitely I was a, I was a young kid, you know, I was, uh, I think I was 19, 20 years old when I was running that, that year. And, um, you know, I made a lot of mistakes along the way that season, but, you know, had a lot of good races as well. And um, I was aggressive for sure. Um, you know, it was just one of those instances that, especially at Iowa, where I had such a fast car and I, and I knew I had a car that could win um, and I just needed to get to the front. So I was running out of laps and, and was just wanting to do whatever I could. And, you know, I could yeah. see my first IndyCar podium um, and I wasn't going to let anything, you know, come in the way of that. Um, and, you know, looking back and talking to Ed, and, you know, we're friends now, and, and, and um, you know, I'm sure he would have done the same thing if he was a 20-year-old kid. So, um, yeah, we're okay, and, and you know, I, I definitely learned from that season how to reel it in and, and not just go super aggressive the whole race. Um, you know, I mean, like, a week before the season started, we were testing in Barber, and, and I crashed early in the 
practice session and s snapped my wrist and had the race like the first half of the season with a broken wrist. Um, and then once that got healed up and I was able to attack, you know, I, I ended up getting in some, some scuffles with like Ed and, and, you know, and then I had some stuff in Detroit. Um, and then I had to crash at Pocono. Um, but, you know, we were able to come home with strong results. The P3 at Iowa, um, the fifth at Fontana, um, a couple top tens. So, you know, I was, I was pleased with how it went. But looking back, like, I wish um, I got this opportunity to race at Chip Ganassi probably, like, I don't know, three to five years later down the road. Um, I just think I was just so young and so, so green, um, just not really knowing what IndyCar racing took and, and what it was all about. And I was in such a big opportunity in, in, in a good car. Um, I just kind of wish I, I was able to go back and, and do it a slightly different, maybe start out on a smaller team, um, learn the basics, you know, not have all that pressure of being on a huge team like Chip Ganassi. Um, and then, you know, a few years later, maybe get that opportunity at Chip Ganassi. But at the end of the day, I'm super grateful for that opportunity I had and I learned a lot. And, um, you know, not a lot of people get to say they drove for Chip Ganassi Racing, so it's something that was definitely cool and one I'll never forget. And you know, being able to be teammates with guys like Scott Dixon and Tony Kanaan, it's 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 pretty incredible what you can learn from those guys. Well, and I, I can appreciate what you're saying, but you're also in this unique situation, Sage, where five Indy 500s by the age of 23, which is really crazy. And if you continue this where you're able to stay around the sport and compete in you know, Indy regularly, by the time you get to 33, you'll be at what, 15 Indy 500. So that's going to be a very impressive run. Let's talk a little bit about the next few years though, as that opportunity kind of went away. And now you move over to the DRR team where you've kind of stayed for the last five or six years. But at that point in time, it was really a one race a year kind of an operation. Can you talk to us about the differences between a Indy 500 only operation versus a behemoth like C uh, Chip, Gr Chip Ganassi Racing? Because I have to assume there's so many differences because, you know, CGR is only prepping, you know, four cars for every single race. Whereas uh, for you guys, you've got one race to focus on and that's where all of your attention, all of your resources are going. Yeah, I mean, you know, when you have you know, the resources of four cars or, you know, you look at the likes of Andretti with like six, um, it, it, it can be quite difficult going up against those powerhouses. Um, you know, they can basically go through a checklist of setup stuff in a day for what, you know, we would be able to do for basically the whole month of practice. So, um, you know, and, and just all the races leading up to Indy and after and for many seasons now, you know, the data that they've collected, um, that we haven't been able to because we've only just done one race a season. Um, it's hard to go up against that. Um, so I always kind of look forward to, um, you know, like big changes in the series. Like if it's a new chassis or, or they're running a new tire or something like that, you know, to just try and level the playing field a little bit. Um, but it is a lot of pressure, you know, going and just doing the one race and, and it being the biggest race, um, you know, just knowing what it can do for your career um, to do well in it. Um, so, you know, when you're not in a car for a full year and then you got to jump back in it and, you know, it being at Indy and, um, you know, it can be stressful, especially when you're doing qualifying and um, when you take all the downforce out of the thing and you get the extra horsepower and you're just trying to hold on to it. Um, and you're not really knowing what it's going to do just because you don't have that experience all season long. Um, it's definitely stressful. Um, but, you know, I've been with this team for a long time. I've done six of my seven Indy 500s with them. Um, so they've been, they've been like a family to me. Um, you know, most of the guys that are still on my car were there for my first 500. So um, it's pretty cool. You know, I have that, that relationship with them and, and my engineer. It's almost like I can come in and, and not even say to my engineer what, what the car is doing just by looking at my data and, and how he can see the look in my eyes. It's just, you know, oh, he's, he's – freaked out right now the car's too loose or something um you know it makes the the month go a lot smoother and you know we can just kind of go through the normal checklist we usually do because we're just so used to it so there is a benefit in it but yeah it definitely is an uphill battle of, of trying to take the fight to these powerhouse teams and you also had some experience with carlin uh, a couple of years ago where you got to run a couple more races with them you're now getting into the swing where 2020 with drr couple more races at the Indy GP as well with some good pace on display as well. How do you think this is going to 
transform. We're about to talk about sim racing a little bit more and how the last 12 months have kind of boomed in your case uh, because of your performances on some of these official iRacing competitions. What do you think you can do when it comes to finding more funding for, you know, going out for maybe a full season campaign? How does sim racing tie back into this? Yeah, I mean, there's like two businesses now in real life racing. You've got your on-track business and your off-track business. Um, and if your off-track business isn't booming, then, you know, you don't really have an on-track business. So, um, you know, not only are you a race car driver, but, you know, you're a salesperson, you're a businessman now. And, um, you know, the companies nowadays don't just write big checks like they used to. And, and you have to try and find, you know, unique ways to... Um, you know, to get funding and how you're going to help these companies, whether it's B2B opportunities or, you know, just offering them something that is is appealing to them. Um, so that's just been a huge challenge, you know, and especially with the pandemic year, um, companies are definitely struggling. Um, so it's harder than ever right now to, to get funding. Um, but, you know, looking at sim racing, sim racing is just another, it could be another outlet to help that, um, you know, whether it's, you know, having these big, you know, like you said, official races that that iRacing puts together, and and if you can kind of do a deal with a company that hey, I can get you on these sim racing cars, um, you know, and and you know you're trying to get them on the real car, it just kind of sweetens the pot a little bit, um, and you know, streaming has become quite big, so you know, I try and stream for the big races and, you know, put the company logos out there and everything. It's just all these little things that could add up to try and get a deal done. So um, sim racing is definitely one of those things that is a, a tool that, you know, all these drivers in, in, in the real life world um, can use to just benefit. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, of course, you know, as things continue to develop, those opportunities will uh, become more and more um, lucrative uh, in in a sense. But, you know, going back to more of the start, your sim racing sort of thing, at least on the world championship level side of things, of course, you were able to qualify for the uh, Porsche Leipzig event, the Porsche Sim Racing Summit. Um, and of course, you got the chance to go to Leipzig and, like you said, meet with uh, your future teammates <laughs> in that case. Um, you know, was that just sort of was that decision just sort of on a whim, or did you know that maybe that sim racing uh, could also be done and comp and really complement your real life racing in a way where um, you, you can leverage both to you know maybe even in a financial sense to try and get yourself by? Um, it was kind of on a, on a limb. Um, you know, I. I... I, uh, I think I was at a point in my career where I was like kind of frustrated with real racing and not getting the opportunities that I thought I could I should be getting um, you know being that due to funding or, or whatever and you know I thought you know looking back like I was at that time I was just sitting there thinking you know there's guys that I beat in Indy Lights and everything that have full full-time rides and and it was frustrating for me so um, it was just kind of like a perfect timing thing where I saw on the home page of the iRacing website that they were doing this event um, and it was just a time trial and it was baseline setups like I, I knew nothing about setting up a car on on iRacing and, and any of the little tricks of the trade I guess you could say um, so I always like to stick with the the fixed setup stuff um, so when I saw this I was like alright this is pretty cool you know everyone's got the same stuff and it's just whoever wants to put in the most time and and um, you know can execute a lap you know, it was very appealing to me, um, and it turned into this like, like obsession. I, I, you know, I think it was like over two weeks long. We did this, you know, at two different tracks, and um, I didn't make the cut in the first week at uh, Laguna Seca. Um, I, you know, I, I was close, you know, but I, but I missed it by a few spots. You know, they only took the top fifteen um, for that week. So then the next week was at Brands, and you know, I just put every hour of the day I could into this, um, you know, into my sim, sim experience with that. I, um, I did thousands of laps, I think. And, uh, you know, I'm surprised my fiance now, yeah, girlfriend at the time stuck with me through this time because I literally would wake up and it would be like 7am and I'd wobble into this sim room and I'd take like four or five bottles of water with me and I'd sit in there until, um, dinner and I'd come out, I'd eat dinner, and then I'd go straight back in there. And, you know, I, I would basically be up till about midnight, one o'clock, and I would do that every day to try and qualify for this event. And 
you know, usually I thought for these events you'd be searching for like tenths of a second. Well, we were searching for thousandths, and like a thousandth of a second can move you up like three or four spots. Um, it was incredibly tight, and it came down to the last day. And I remember I was in, I was actually out of um, town. I was in New York City, and I'm just like stalking this website results page. <laughs> like, am I gonna slip? And and I was prepared to leave New York City early and drive home because I only live an hour and a half from New York City um, and drive home before the cutoff to try and put in laps and and beat the times I needed to if 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 needed um, but luckily I didn't have to do that and I was safe in and um, yeah I got to go out there and uh, I think it was funny like I, I I kind of think I got like a weird look when I walked in like they were like who is this kid because you know it was it was mostly the normal names, you know, that were all there, like the world championship drivers. Um, and then there was this, this real driver of an IndyCar, and they were just like, well, why is he here? What's he doing? And, and for me, it was just one of those things where it was a cool opportunity, um, you know, to get in front of, you know, the Porsche folks and, and, and do this cool event that I had no idea, you know, what I was doing at. Um, and I had a lot of fun with it. And, I, you know, I met a lot of cool people. And, um, from there it was like, Hey, I'm going to take my sim racing to the next level. And I think when I qualified for that event, my I rating was only like 2,400. I mean, it was like pretty bad. So, um, you know, I, but that was basically, I only used I racing for just learning tracks and stuff. So from there I said, you know, I'm gonna, you know, take this more seriously. And, and that was one of the things that Kawanda said to me was, you know, hey, we need you to get your I rating up. And within a month, I went from like 24, 2500 to, to 5k. Um, <laughs> and then that's when we did, you know, Daytona and stuff. So that was kind of the start of the relationship. And um, they're great guys, you know, I mean, they, they're an amazing team. It's, it's so cool seeing how they operate. It's basically like being on a real world team. Um, you know, the amount of time they put in for these setups and strategy, um, especially for the endurance races, um, it, it's, it's quite impressive. And, you know, my goal is to try and, you know, get involved in, in some of the world championship stuff. Um, uh, but man, these guys are just so good. It's so hard. I, I tried to qualify for the, uh, Porsche esports, uh, cup, you know, a couple seasons ago, not, not this year's, but last year's. And, um, I just missed out on it. Um, but man, it, it's you got to be on top of your game, um, and you can't screw up. And I mean, you're seeing that now in the series this year. You know, with Sebastian and, and Josh. You know, I think everyone thought that was like the huge fight, and Sebastian's just kind of having like an off year with how Josh had last year, just some bad luck. Um, and Josh is just keeping it clean. But you know, at the end of the day, these guys are just so close, and anybody can win on any given day, and you just can't relax. Well, and Sage, you will at least in my opinion, one of the first drivers that embraced sim racing, not just for fun, not just to test out stuff, but from that competition aspect as well. Over the past weekend, you just competed in the VCO Cup of Nations with two other drivers who have started doing this as well. Now, Jack Crawford and Phil Dinez. But what do you think has... Why do you think you made that jump? I want to ask you that. You talked about some frustration. You talked about looking at a team like Kawanda, seeing how professional they are. But even for someone like yourself, when you're a real racing driver trying to pursue opportunities, around this time, I think you were also a test driver for the Lexus uh, GT3 car that was going through its development process as well. Why did you jump onto this Kawanda train, as it were? And one question, what do you think the one thing Kawanda does better than some of the teams in the real world do? Yeah, well, I think the reason I got appealed to sim racing in a bigger way was just because of the growth of it. Um, you know, seeing how far sim racing has come, um, and now you know big companies are getting involved with it, and you know there's starting to be like a significant amount of prize money involved. Um, and racing's all I know, so sim racing to me was just one of those things where, um, hey, I'm doing something that I love um, with racing, and hey, if you can do well enough at it and win some money, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely a win-win. So, um, and the, the appeal at Kawanda was, um, you know, they're basically the Penske of sim racing, you know, in my opinion, looking out, uh, looking in from an outsider's perspective, they were the, they are the best, you know? So, um, you know, that was like a big admiration to, to try and get involved with them. You know, it was, it would, kind of be treated like you know me trying to get in a big ride in real life you know that was kind of how I approached it with with sim racing I wanted to be around the best I wanted to learn from the best and um, you know thankfully they they allowed me to do that so 
Um, yeah, I just think the appeal has just been the growth of sim racing. I think, you know, over the pandemic year especially, there haven't been a lot of people that have, you know, come out succeeding from this pandemic. But I think one thing is for sure that sim racing did, in fact, you know, grow from this pandemic. It's one of the few things that actually made this thing positive. Um, you know, we were able to see sim racing on national television um, with the real world drivers racing. Um, you know, I think many households who maybe didn't have a, a sim rig in their house before now do um, because people wanted to do something. And, and it was one of those things that you could just go do whenever you wanted. And, um, you know, and it can become an obsession of trying to get better and faster and, and you know, with I, with I racing, how they work with I rating and safety rating, you know, trying to get those, those numbers better. It's, um, you know, it can definitely become an obsession, but a good obsession. And, um, you know, I'm happy that it's part of my life and, and, um, you know, for how big it's grown the last few years, I'm, I'm just really excited to see how far it's going to grow. You know, um, I don't think it's many years out from, from being really, really popular. Um, and, you know, I, real racing is always going to be real racing, but sim racing, I think there's going to be a point where I think there's going to be big money involved and people are, you know, drivers may be getting paid pretty big money. Um, and hey, man, if you're, you know, say your racing career in real life's done and or, you know, you don't want to take the risk of real racing anymore, you know, I mean, you're safe in your sim rig unless you turn your force feedback up a little too high or something. But, you know, it's, uh, it's definitely um, on the rise and looking forward to seeing where it goes. Well, we're going to talk a little bit more about the boom to wrap up and a couple of things in particular about uh, some deals you've signed with uh, HyperX as well. But a couple more questions before we get there, Sage. I want to ask you as a power slide motorsports driver, Adam Blocker, my teammate, I want to ask what that experience is like because you've had a very fun fight with him in the Lionheart IndyCar series over the last few years. And I think last year you had the opportunity to then have him on your pit wall as he makes his own, you know, step into the IndyCar paddock as a trackside engineer. What do you think it's like to have this influx of people in the sim world who, like you say, maybe for whatever reason don't have funding, don't have the ability to go out there and compete in the real world, to do this in the virtual world, do it on the side, compete at the high level, and then still go off and do what is their passion and their main focus, you know, on their day job side. Yeah, I mean, um, definitely cool, you know, to see these these people all around real racing being involved in sim racing. I mean, I've even had mechanics um, get in to iRacing and ask me for advice with, you know, what they should buy and, and all these things. So um, it's cool to be able to connect with people in the real world, um, you know, on the sim and vice versa, seeing people from sim racing, you know, getting opportunities in, in real world racing. Um, you know, Adam, you know, is a prime example of, you know, we've, we're kind of rivals in Lionheart Race Series, you know, they're, they start up next week, you know, they have a retro and an IndyCar series. And um, again, it was one of those really appealing series to me because it was all fixed setup racing and I could just go on and have fun and um, race, you know, IndyCar fans and stuff. And, and, you know, it's been, it's been really cool. And um, Adam was kind of like the, the, um, the champion over there and, and, won a lot of stuff over there so he was always the guy that you know I wanted to beat and chase and we ended up having some really good battles and um, you know we've also taken each other out a few times and built kind of a rivalry and then you know fast forward a few months and next thing you know he's working for Chevy um, as an engineer and um, he's on my pit wall you know managing my my race engine at the uh, Indy Grand Prix um, so you know, we we <laughs> it, it was it was funny. You know, it was fun. It was professional. But I was always just saying, hey, make sure you know you don't put an Indy Lights engine in this thing. You know, because we did have a rivalry. But at the end of the day, we were professional. We had a lot of fun. Um, and you know, I think we, it was like we built kind of a better relationship because of that real um, life experience we had. And and. Uh, you know, but then when it came down to it, no matter how nice and professional we were in real life, when we got back onto the sim, we were fierce competitors and wanted to, to beat each other more than anything. So, um, you know, I, I think chapter three of me and Blocker's rivalries or, you know, fights is, is going to start again here soon next week and uh, should be a lot of fun. 
of course, you know, uh, uh, just going into another little sort of escapade you had with regards to Rallycross, because you competed in the American Rallycross Championship for a couple of rounds in the ARX2 category. Of course, you're no stranger to it in the iRacing side of things as well. You know, how, how, how did that come about, and how did those two little, the, the sim iRacing Rallycross and the real-life Rallycross interact between each other? Yeah, I mean, that kind of came about, um, you know, Dry and Reinbold Racing, um, you know, they had a team in, in Rally, and with us only running one race a season, um, you know, they were just trying to find ways to keep me sharp, and, and they had an opening, um, and said, hey, do you want to do some of these races? And I said, sure, you know, so um, I went and I tested the car, um, basically in a parking lot, um, <laughs> and they, they set up like a track there with like cones and stuff and I tested with a lot of their other drivers and um, I did really well and I, I was quick um, but it was all asphalt and um, you know I've never drove intentionally on dirt before um, so you know that I knew that was going to kind of be a big learning experience for me um, and you know they, they said hey let's go do this race in a few months and I said sure you know it should be fun and um, I didn't really know what to expect and I you know I went out there or actually beforehand I, I did do a lot of the iRacing um, rally stuff just to see if I could you know learn how to do this dirt dirt stuff and um, you know big you know came came to my surprise that it was actually really really close I mean iRacing's done a really good job with with um, dirt and I've heard that before from like sprint car drivers and stuff of they rave about iRacing's you know dirt model and um, you know, I, I, I learned a lot on it. I went in and um, did my first race and, and got second. And um, the dirt was, was a lot easier to adjust to than I thought. I thought it was going to be a lot more difficult. Um, but I do think iRacing helped me quite a bit on that. And um, we went on to do most of the season. I missed, I think, uh, one weekend because of uh, I was racing in Toronto in IndyCar. Um, but, um, you know, I didn't finish, finish any worse than second and, and had a win in there towards the end of the season. So um, was definitely cool, definitely a different type of racing, you know, just, you know, banging doors for, you know, only like five lap races and just going 110 um, percent. It was totally different from what I was used to with IndyCar racing, you know, not being able to, to bounce off anything and, um, you know, having those longer, longer races. Um, and now it was just completely opposite, but it was a lot of fun. Um, and I would totally be open to doing some more of that. Um, you know, I'd really love to try an actual supercar, um, and seeing what that's like, you know, having a teammate on Kawanda with, uh, Mitchell DeJong, um, he raced a lot of that as well. Um, and he's kind of like the master of, of, uh, I racing rally stuff. So, um, you know, just hearing how he talks about it and his experience was, a, you know, it's pretty cool. And, I, you know, I asked him a lot of questions before I actually did my first rally race in real life um, just to prep for that. So it was just another kind of cool crossover that sim racing had for real racing. You know, I wouldn't have really have known Mitchell if it wasn't for sim racing. I knew of Mitchell, but I didn't really know him on a personal level. And now it's, you know, we're, we're great friends. And so let's wrap this thing up then, Sage, by talking a little bit about couple of things that we've kind of hinted at over the course of the interview so far. DIR, uh, DRR rather, participated in four races in 2020, and as sim racing continues to boom, you have been able to sign some more deals. The most recent one was HyperX, which I have to say, you must uh, partially thank Lionheart and Georgia and Zaldo for all of the help that they got to get across the line with that one. Any chance that we see that HyperX car uh, on the grid in the real world potentially as well or is that going to be something that starts in you know the virtual sim and then we'll see where that takes us from there yeah i mean obviously i um yeah did get involved with HyperX um with a big help of lionheart race series with george um you know they're uh they're a big gaming company um you know have have incredible stuff for for, for your rigs and um any other type of gaming you want to do um you know, I think their big thing was right now they're trying to get and show what real world athletes, you know, use gaming and, and um, you know, sim racing or whatever. I'm their first sim racer, um, but it's a really cool experience and um, they're taking it really serious. And, you know, I think we're going to be doing one of those cartoons that they do. Um, you know, you, I'm sure you've seen it on the Lionheart pre-race stuff. They show all those cartoons of the uh, professional athletes and stuff. So we're going to do one of those. Um, you know, 
I think ideally, you know, I think it'd be it'd be cool to have the HyperX car on the the actual IndyCar grid. Um, it's definitely been kind of the idea has been thrown around. Um, you know, we're kind of talking about it, so we'll see where it leads. I think right now the main thing was just kind of getting me on as an ambassador, doing some sim racing, streaming, seeing how it works, um, and then go from there. But um, I don't think it's totally out of question that hopefully in the you know the future, uh, hopefully near future, you know, we'll see the HyperX car in real life. Yeah, continuing on the sim racing topic, of course, with the whole pandemic, you know, IndyCar wasn't able to race, so therefore they did the um, did the virtual um, IndyCar series on uh, on iRacing with all of the, uh, uh, or rather most of the real life drivers taking part in that. And of course, the first event at Watkins Glen, uh, you came away with the win. Did uh, did anyone uh, did anyone on the IndyCar side really treat you any differently after that? Just thinking, oh, this 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 guy seems to have a lot of talent on this sim stuff. Um. It was it was quite funny actually uh, because when they announced they were doing that series, um, I, everybody kind of knew I was like the the sim guy of real racing and IndyCar. So all of a sudden I went from just kind of living normal day life and and sim racing to then having a lot of friends. You know, I uh, my phone was constantly ringing of nearly every driver in the paddock. Hey man, like what settings do I run on this? Or you know, how do I set up these pedals on here? And um, you know, I, I had I was like the most popular guy for a little bit there, um, and it was cool, you know. And and you know, I was one of the I'm one of those guys that I'm never gonna um, not help you know people, especially these people. You know, they're my friends in real life, and um, so you know, I, I would give them everything I knew and and help them along the way, um, you know, and and just seeing how competitive they got from that very first race to the last race was um was quite impressive you know i was able to win that first race which was cool and, and you know then after that um that night i was on sports center which um you know as a, i feel like as a kid you know it was like one of your goals in life was i want to be on sports center one day i don't know what for but for something whether it's you know i'm making a game-winning touchdown or winning the indy 500 who knows but i want to be on sports center one day and um, I was on it, and I was on it for something I didn't think I would be on it for, and that was for winning a sim race. And um, that was cool because it, it, you know, you don't really get on Sports Center even if you win like a normal IndyCar race, other than if it being the Indy 500. So to win a sim race and it be on Sports Center, I think showed you know how big sim racing was becoming, especially during that time. Um, and that gave me a lot of exposure, and it gave iRacing a lot of exposure, and um, it gave my my real team, Dry and Reinbold, and their sponsors, um, you know, Wix and and everybody else involved, a lot of exposure. So it was a win-win for everybody. And um, you know, we went on in that series, and um, you know, I, I didn't win another race, but I was you know leading a lot of those races, and, and you know, I'd end up getting taken out or or something. But at the end of the day, it was it was a lot of fun, and and. Um, you know, now I'm trying to do more of those big events, you know, like we're doing the VCO stuff right now, um, which has been a lot of fun as well. And I'm teammates with, with Mac and that, um, you know, so being teammates with one of my, my sim guys that I, that I know, um, has been quite easy to work with and, and we're having fun with that. And I think we're like third in the championship or something. So, um, that's been fun. You know, we just did the, the VCO pro cup of nations, um, I think we were the favorites to win Team USA, but we basically just like <laughs> choked in every aspect. Uh, that was probably the worst day of sim racing I've ever had in my life. Um, but it was fun. You know, we had a lot of fun, and but I mean, just everything that could go wrong went wrong. Like the first race, so I just redid my office. So I re, you know, routed all my cables to my simulator and everything. Um, and the first race, I was running second, and my steering wheel unplugged itself um i didn't have enough slack to it and it did that three times during that race so i had to plug it back in three times during that race so that kind of screwed that and it was just little things like that the whole day that the little gremlins that just didn't work you know and then we went to indy and i was like oh i'm excited to race the indy car around the speedway well sure enough you know my teammates starting first hits the curb and spins and takes out half the field including me so um it was just little things like that but we had a lot of fun and and um those are the events right now that i really look forward to and i enjoy doing and you know i'll definitely be trying to get in and getting involved in in you know the future of those 
Uh, well, I, I think I'll take a little bit of the commentator's curse blame there because I predicted you guys would win uh, the Cup of Nations right off the bat. And yeah, as you say, uh, not it didn't go that way at all. Uh, final question before we wrap up, Sage. Uh, we talked about this iRacing IndyCar Challenge, which I think it was called last year. It's just been confirmed that will return for 2021 as uh, the calendar had to be pushed back just a little bit. What are you thinking that this will hold for you? And I don't know if you've confirmed publicly your actual racing plans for the year, if it's going to be an expanded uh, set of races or just the IndyCar 500, Indy 500 rather, this year. Is this an opportunity in your mind to, especially in these times where it's very hard for companies to commit funding due to the pandemic, is this an opportunity for once again you to go out there, show just how strong you are in terms of your raw ability and maybe get a few more sponsors on board? Um, yeah, for sure. I'll be definitely you know, looking forward to take part in that. Um, I'll probably come into it with a different attitude this year and, and you know I took it serious last year but I'm probably gonna go full bore into it this year um, and especially with you know knowing how far a lot of these guys have come now in sim racing I mean you got you look like you look at like guys like Alex Polo for example who basically didn't do eye racing last year at all um, and got it you know basically right around that whole time now all of a sudden he's over 7,000 7, I rating um, and racing on, on a big team and you know so I know for me to now win those races I'm going to have to really bring my A game and really prep for them um, and yeah I mean I think it is just another opportunity for sponsors and um, getting your name out there I, I know when we did it the first time like Team Penske and their drivers were taking it super super serious like I mean I'm just sitting there with like my JRT and, and going through everything um, and that was just basically it. I mean, I didn't have anybody in my ear. Well, you know, Penske had like all their real engineers and everything involved with this, like working strategy and fuel numbers out, whatever. And I mean, it was pretty insane to see, you know, the level that they were doing it at. So, um, looking forward to it. I'll definitely turn it up a notch. I think as far as serious and commitment level to it this time around, and hopefully I can, you know, get some more wins and come out on top. And of course, that's not the only competition you'll be in. Lionheart and uh, their entire suite of competitions kicks off next week live on RaceBot TV. Be excited to kick that off as well. Uh, thanks for joining us, Sage. Really fun chat and uh, looking forward to seeing you compete in Lionheart over the course of this year. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. Looking forward to Lionheart. Should be fun. So that's going to be it then for our first episode in 2021 of Talking Tents. Before we go, let's preview the upcoming weekend of action live on RaceSpot TV. First on Friday, it's a doubleheader of official iRacing action with two weeks left in the first season of the year. First up, it's Indy Pro 2000 as they head to Spa Franco Shop, followed by Friday night primetime as the Dallara IR01 heads stateside to Road America. Then on Saturday, it's time for the second iRacing special event of the year as we head to land down under for the iRacing Bathurst 12 Hours. Just one event on Sunday, that's the Porsche Esports Carrera Cup Great Britain as the championship fight heads the penultimate round at Silverstone. For now though, my name is Arjuna Kankipati and for myself, Connery Maddock and Hugo Luis and the entire team at RaceBot TV, thanks for watching the first Talking Fence episode in 2021 and we'll see you in two weeks time.